two all at the same time, what is our what is our understanding level? Let's measure. I think Dan's going to go. Okay. Same question? Same, Same question. question. Not until they're happy and she's <laughs> uh, Can you repeat the question? <laughs> yes. How can we make sure kids are getting exposed to principles of information architecture so that college or graduate school is not the first time they're encountering these things? I think somebody here needs to make that content. I think somebody here needs to make that content. Uh, I haven't seen it. Uh, I have children. I have three children. Uh, they uh, understand what I do through osmosis. Uh, <laughs> they have friends. Uh, one of my daughter's friends, uh, after my daughter explained to her what her dad does, said, oh, it's like the woman in, in Inception. Uh, and and that, that's flattering, but that isn't the, that, that, that is good. <laughs> so uh, as, as I want to do, uh, uh, I would like to ladder up from uh, what Abby does. And uh, the combination of somebody making explicitly on purpose uh, material, I don't know if it's a book, I don't know that kids read, uh, but making content about this and then uh, uh, combining that with what we'll do as parents, uh, I think that's what I do. Okay, so how do we, yes, we have to do this all simultaneously. So how do we feel about our level of understanding for that question? something. Um, so, first of all, I, we, I have a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old daughter, uh, and I think I'm not totally sure they understand what I do or what information architecture is, so maybe I'm not the best person to answer this. Uh, they have not read any of my books, and I don't think they will for at least 10 or 20 years. Um, let me flip the question around a little bit. I, I'm not sure that uh, I mean, as Ted Nelson mentioned the other, the other night, uh, most people, most adults right, in the world have heard of information architecture. Even those who have don't really get it. Um, I don't actually think that our community has done a poor job of communicating uh, the principles and value of information architecture. I think there's a cultural resistance to complex things like systems thinking and information architecture. Uh, so it's not an easy task. Um, that said, my answer to the question would be to send several million copies of Abby's book to 7th and 8th graders around the world. questions, we're going to have chances to filter those in as we go. So as soon as you have a question forming in your mind that you'd like to bring to these panelists, come up and maybe we can gather up over, over in this area and we'll, we'll work you in as we go. So we would love to have additional participation from you. These questions come from you guys, but as we have a conversation, more things are going to come up. So we want some carefully controlled chaos. Okay. Okay. So the next question. Okay. How can we get better? Oh, we need a person. Would you like to start? Sure. Yeah. Okay. How can we get better at pivoting between front end information architecture and back end information architecture? Because we're dealing with data so much all these days. 
and we influence where well, we influence the design of the data schema and the APIs that are all over the place. Jeez. Yeah, these are the easy ones. I'm gonna punt to Dan. Ooh. 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 Strategy. <laughs> Uh, I think we should refuse to pivot. It's the same thing all the way through. And uh, uh, that isn't so easy to understand, so let me unpack that a little bit. Uh, just like that podcast that I mentioned yesterday, 99% Invisible, that's a nice way to talk about architecture. So much of it isn't visible. Uh, if the front part is the visible and the back part is invisible, uh, there's a continuity between those. And if we let the people that we work with uh, frame that for us as a, a need to pivot, then we lose the, we lose the threat. So uh, being better at collaborating uh, all the way through. But, but I would hesitate to let it be characterized as a pivot or a shift, because it's the same thing. OK, what do you think? <laughs> I was hoping not to have to, and you guys just said I didn't need to. So okay. thank you for agreeing. The world is in a good place. Um, this question sort of overlaps now some of the answering, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at it too. Um, will it ever, let's start with Dan. Will it ever not be hard to explain the value of what we do? Lots of people have this theme in their questions. <laughs> they really want to know this one. Can I see if my preferred lifeline is in the room? Is Cat King here? Uh, okay. Get on up here. <laughs> She uh, was subjected to the imperial conditioning uh, the microphone with your name on it, ladies. Of, of having taken the course that I get to teach at the University of Michigan. And so uh, uh, I don't know that I could say whether it's hard or not hard. Um, so the question of when will it not be hard, I think, uh, would benefit from somebody who was asked to learn it recently. Uh, to measure the distance between here and there. So, uh, what was my repeat the question? Re <laughs> okay, I'm uh -huh. breakfast. Okay, lifeline, this is for you. Will it ever not be hard to explain the value of what we do? Um, you can no? use it. <laughs> wrong with hard? Why are we not allowed to do hard things? Why are organizations trying to simplify when they should be trying to explore complexity first? Why is change up how you guys are going to communicate your level of understanding. So for this one, instead of hooting and hollering and clapping, as the, as the panelists answer the question, stand up when you feel like you personally have a level of understanding. And once the room is all standing, we have achieved the answer. Okay? Yes. If you stop understanding, should you sit down? <laughs> Yes, we're going to graph the curves. <laughs> okay. Peter, would you like to start with this one? Sure. Okay. How do you select and measure which set of ethics you apply to a project? And that came in from about three people. <laughs> so I, I sort of thought this topic of ethics might, might come up uh, because, it, because of last night's keynote, although I'm, 
Is, was it recent this, one? This came up recently. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, sort of dreading that. Um, and so I think it's extremely difficult to talk about ethics in any sort of public setting. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult for us to be honest about the topic. Um, I think the way that what we saw with Elizabeth Buchanan's um, questions, the first set of questions, are you, know, are you a racist, are you a sexist, no hands go up, um, compared to the second set of questions where we were okay putting our hands up, shows that we're all uncomfortable being totally honest uh, in a public setting. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about ethics other than to say it's a very personal, uh, personal matter. It's something that we should all reflect upon. Um, the choices that we make, we live with for the rest of our lives. And the best recommendation I have for folks is to read uh, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Uh, if you read that, it will stick with you for the rest of your life, uh, and you may think about your actions uh, a little differently. So we have no. Let me let's refresh some of this. As you achieve understanding, <laughs> not much stand understanding. up. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah. You have to repeat the question like every couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. All right. So ideally, we keep standing so we get the whole room standing. This is too hard. Half standing, standing is hard. <laughs> All right. Let's sit down and we'll, as the next speaker comes up, then you can stand again. We'll do stand and sit. That'll work. Okay. So, Abby, you have a hand? Can you repeat the question? Yes. yes. The frame is important. Okay, so the question is how do you select and measure which set of ethics you apply to a project? I don't know that select is the right construct for me in the way that I do my work. I feel like collection of the values that exist in an organization and comparison of those values to the effect they want to have on society is a really important part of my job. But I don't have like a standard set that I'm picking from. Um, I don't think that we can have a standard set that we're picking from. I actually think that the standard set that we have is what we're picking from, and that's sort of the problem. So, I don't, yeah, I don't, uh, I think it's more about discussing the values within your organization and the impact that those values have on not just your users or your profit margin, but on the world that your children will live in once you are not there any longer. So. Okay, so let's let everyone stand. Let's stand. Uh, no, I think I remember. Uh, in my class that I get to teach, uh, I've been avoiding the work of Christopher Alexander uh, for the last several. Uh, I I redo it every time I teach it, and I used to dab a little, and then I stopped because uh, he's a really. Uh, angry man <laughs> who has uh, a really finger-waggy kind of way of saying uh, how things ought to be done. And uh, it's, I have a problem with that. But relative to this question, uh, the technique that he teaches us to use for uh, making structure uh, I don't know that we could center all of our practice on the way that he would have us do it, but here's one thing that he says, which is uh, uh, when you have options, because I think that's where this also comes in, is when there are options uh, that have ethical consequences to them, uh, you can look at your options and asking each of those options uh, in the presence of this, uh, am I more whole? than in the presence of that. Uh, another way that he runs the question is, uh, uh, so if you look at a Michael Graves teapot that kind of looks like Hitler, and a uh, teapot that your grandma used, look at each of those and say, uh, which one of these, if this had to be the representation of myself, 
uh, all of me, not just the parts that are uh, public, but my whole self, which of these is the representation that I would select? And if you looked at that work on your bench as if that were a reflection of you, because it, it always is, uh, that should, it's so subjective, like, like Peter and Abby were both saying, so you're the subject. Uh, ask yourself, if I were to do it this way, would I feel whole? Uh, if I did it this way, would I be able, would I be happy to be accountable for that as an avatar for me? And uh, I doubt we could make as many evil things as we make if we did it that way. So let's move to the next question. Would you like to start, Abby? Sure. Okay. Okay. The question, when we think about fields that sit at influential centers of our information society, such as data journalism and big data science, is it our obligation to reach out to these practitioners about good IA practice? Yes. yes. Why should information architecture be considered a discipline rather than just a skill or competency within a bigger discipline? You have, you all have a lifeline except for Dan. I have one. You can punt. <laughs> I want to say that. Maybe one of the reasons uh, gets back to the earlier question about uh, kids these days and <laughs> how you have few kids. And uh, if it's a discipline, it shows up in the academic catalog of colleges that they look at. Uh, has anybody here looked at a college catalog or a list of courses you didn't even know that was a thing? So. Uh, that's on the basis of what I would like to see the outcomes uh, be. But I think the question is, and is the person who asked the question here? It's okay. Because uh, uh, I think I would want to know a little bit more about the what was underneath the question. But uh, uh, making it be a discipline, and a lot of the people in this room have been, uh, I think fighting is the right word, to make it be a discipline. And uh, Part of the, the propelling energy for that, for many of you, you fighters out there, you know who you are, uh, is I think because of uh, the kids. Uh, if you make it be a discipline, people will know about it. And uh, my course is buried in an HCI and librarianship world. And uh, I meet graduates from the University of Michigan School of Information all the time who have no idea what information architecture is. Okay. So, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, I was sort of fairly active in, in trying to help establish an information architecture as a discipline, and uh, you know we were we had a certain degree of success getting the polar bear book actually taught in academic courses at the sort of you know, undergraduate and graduate level, um, but made, made very little headway in terms of establishing I-8 as a discipline. Um, I've sort of come to not really care about that or not really want that for I-8. Um, as, as Ted Nelson was sort of alluding to or specifically saying in his talk, there's a lot broken in academia today and in the way that we structure disciplines. Um, and I'm not sure I want that for information architecture. I've always thought of 
IA as a bridge, uh, as a way of connecting other disciplines and areas of thought and practices. And I'm perfectly happy for us to have no actual territory, um, but to continue to play that role of, of forging connections. Standards. So I guess my question back would be, why can't we be both? Like, why are we not allowed to be like any other specialty which has people that apply that specialty to projects like cleaning out their garage or making a more effective chore chart for their little kids to follow? I mean, why are we so square on dividing between commonplace information architecture and academic information architecture? They're born of the same ideas. It's just the implementation that's different. And I think that it's it's borderline insulting to say that at the academic level, we're not doing the same things that people are applying at the common sense level. We're just the ones studying it deeply. So I feel like asking questions like that is part of what divides us. And I would really like to see us look at IA as both a specialty and a skill set anyone can have. Hello, Veronica, standing on the table is completely the awesome. <laughs> If anybody else would like to get on that table, I will take it as a sign that we can finish this question. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes. Question back. So does anyone else have other questions? We, we haven't had anyone filter out, but this is a good time if you want to in inject a question before we start into the next section. Anybody? Yeah, come on up. And you guys gather up behind him if you have other questions, too. Going to the building. Right, all right. Uh, so the other day in Los Angeles, Dan did a, what he called a dry run of this presentation. And he was asked the question um, if he could name some great examples of information architecture, and he had, he declined. And uh, I told him I was going to ask him again here today. So that's <laughs> <laughs> examples of great information architecture. Go. I'll take it. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to visit uh, the 9/11 memorial in New York City, uh, but the names that have been displayed of those who passed that day. Um, are organized in a pretty emotional way. Um, they are not organized alphabetically, they're not organized by the companies that those people worked for or the fire department number that they were under. They're organized by their connection to each other on that day. Um, I lack the ability to say these words without getting goosebumps all over my freaking body. That, to me, is beautiful information architecture. The original conception uh, of the iTunes ecology, uh, the way that uh, Apple and, and I, I think Steve was very involved in this, uh, you know, sort of decided which features went on the iPod, uh, which features went on the desktop application, which features went uh, in the online store, was brilliant. It was sort of ahead of its time. It changed the way that we think about uh, what we now call cross-channel design. Um, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, so that's a good example of information architecture, and I, I would just sort of finish by saying that the current iTunes is one of the worst examples. Of <laughs> that I was asked uh, in, in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago was about uh, apps and websites. And uh, so that's where my kind of cranky refusal, uh, I asked the audience if they knew anybody who was an architect, um, and then asked, uh, do those people like anything? <laughs> and uh, th that helped uh, make a little bit of sense, or at least it got a laugh. Um, but I've been thinking about it a little bit more, Chris, and uh, I have an example. Uh, and, the, and some of you know that I, I 
talk down about Apple products and services as examples of information architecture all the time, make my students uh, do this stuff with iTunes all the time. Uh, but this example is I was speaking at an event and uh, I was using an iPhone, uh, which is something that I'm loath to do, but my real phone was broken and in the shop. And so uh, I was borrowing somebody's iPhone and uh, I was in an unfamiliar place and I misplaced it. And uh, I was uh, scared and I, I was, my friend uh, graciously let me borrow this and like uh, panicking. And I went to the information desk and the two volunteers standing there, no, nobody's, nobody's turned in an iPhone since we've been here, but we haven't been here all day. Uh, and they saw my face and uh, one of them had pity on me. He's like, well, here. And, and they just handed me their iPhone. And I tapped in my Apple ID and on this lost your iPhone app, and in a drawer behind the volunteer. <laughs> that was amazing. Information architecture made that possible. So that's, that, that's something that, that uh, made me feel as good as the best experiences I've had in buildings. It's great. Okay. okay. Um, I have been elected to give Chris Chandler his copy of Abby's book, How to Make Sense of Any Mess. So this is yours. We also have, we now have a stack of books from Rosenfeld Media. We give away, oh, we have more questions. Why We Fail by Victor Lombardi. We have Service Design by Andy Colain, LeBron's and Make It So by Nathan Sh Shredoff and Chris Smith. So we have a question. Yes. All right. So I'm a business analyst, and uh, one of the things that I found over the course of this weekend was you don't really hear a lot of mention about my, my discipline, my profession. It's really married with, you know, with IA and user experience and design. And yet, it, I didn't hear a lot of it this weekend. And so I was wondering, you know, I'm, I'm certified. It's a thing. It's a discipline, right? But I'm wondering, what is your impression of this analysis and how it fits into what you do? And I'm not looking for, you know, oh, we love you guys. It's all good. I actually want to know. <laughs> <laughs> where it fits in. Tim? So I've, I've sort of bumped into business analysts, uh, I guess ever since probably 1998, 1999, I remember bumping into some folks at Vanguard who were uh, business analysts, and it's always surprised me that organizations sort of split business analyst kind of work and information architect kind of work. Um, for me, there's no divide. Right, and and I, I kind of um, I I managed to be fairly oblivious to job titles. I don't really care about them. Um, you know, when I kind of talk about being an information architect, or you know, I, I, I think everybody is an information architect. As Abby and I were just talking about uh, the other day, um, being an information architect is like being a poet. Uh, not that many people get paid well to do just that, um, but we're all information architects. We're all poets. Um, so I think that the work of a business analyst is. Um, you know, is a, a, a vital part of the work of information architecture. And however an organization wants to sort of slice and dice the job titles, isn't that interesting to me? Um, but I'm really happy when I work with my clients to work with business analysts and figure out how our, you know, how we can kind of, you know, work together to, uh, you know, to make things work better. Uh, I also get a chance to work with business analysts pretty regularly, um, whether by title or just by function. Um, one of the things I think is interesting about it is it seems that the position of business analyst is to believe that you can put all of your corporate agenda into the head of another human being without getting their stuff all over it. <laughs> so I really struggle with that because I, a good business analyst is able to, like a good information architect, remain uh, the filter and not the grounds in the cup of coffee, but I, I see too many bringing lots of opinions into the room that aren't actually founded in 
in the overall uh, corporate ethos as much as in that personal's mental that person's mental model of how their company works. I also see that because of the um, devaluation of that position, uh, they can be angry uh, as well. And uh, if there's one thing that I understand about angry people is they are not easy to work with. And accessing their mental model is obfuscated by all sorts of craziness. So it's hard to work with a business analyst that is threatened by information architecture. And I think that that's something that, as a community, um, you're right, you didn't hear those words enough this weekend. We're not admitting that business analyst uh, function is something that all of us tend to do as part of our work to get information architecture right. And I think the fact that you have tools and have a certification in that, what I don't, in what I do, uh, makes me wonder what don't I know from what you've got. Uh, so I wish you guys would talk to us more too. It looks like this is pretty well understood, so the one little piece that I'll throw in is uh, uh, business analysts know where the existing information architecture is. Uh, Peter Eisenman uh, is a pedantic crank, so I love him, and uh, he says that uh, architecture is not design, design is synthesis, and architecture is analysis. And uh, if you pair that, that pairs well with the little uh, Andrew Hinton, who talks about invariance in the environment. So UBAs are finding what is invariant in the environment, and that's where the architecture is. You're finding, you're analyzing these places made of information, and you can identify uh, the things that don't change and the things that do. And uh, you're showing them a picture of their architecture uh, before we often are invited in. Okay. Yeah, we we don't. <laughs> <laughs> we don't understand it. Yeah. Did anybody yeah. understand yeah. it? Did I push anybody away from a good place just there? Wild ground. <laughs> 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 okay. Do we have any? Oh, we have another question. Great. Okay. Here's my question down because I. Often forget things while I'm speaking, um, which is unfortunate. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. So maybe this question is about just being a good person, but um, to sound smart, let's say it's about pedagogy. Um, how do you help someone or a group understand and not be intimidated by complexity without chastising them or um, deriding their own worldview or sensibilities? Um, and I guess, follow up, do we have a responsibility to this? Um, like, do we care? Um, so I'm curious about what you guys have to say about that. You get it, you get it. Yes, uh, do I get it right now? Yes. Thanks, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, So I, I do think we have a responsibility to do that, and I think uh, we have an opportunity opportunity to do that. Uh, I think I think that the, the place to start uh, is to help people feel comfortable, right? Um, one way to do that is to wear shorts. <laughs> <laughs> way to do that is to, you know, avoid big fancy words. Uh, another way to do that is to, is to just, you know, embrace your own sort of sense of humility and, and share your own ignorance and lack of knowing with folks. Uh, I am working with the, uh, the Baker Library at the Harvard Business School right now on this wonderful ecosystem mapping project across physical and digital environments. Uh, Harvard Business School is a place where everyone kind of has to pretend that they know everything. Um, and I think that one of my responsibilities on that project is to get folks to admit they don't know, right, so that they can actually work together to fill gaps. Um, and this is, uh, this is one of the first projects where I finally realized, you know, it's not enough to, uh, you know, be the big superhero information architect and fly in and do a bunch of wireframes, 
Um, I am going to be working very closely with my clients at the library to co-create uh, our ecosystem and experience maps uh, so that it's a shared product. Right? So it's taken me a long time to kind of get that, right? that we have to create this together. Uh, we have to admit our ignorance together uh, and move forward together. So I think that, that breaking down those barriers uh, uh, you know, that, that come from pretending we know uh, more than we do uh, it's it's a great opportunity uh, to, to to kind of move things forward. I would say, in terms, I totally agree with what Peter said, and I, I think in terms of practical advice, stop doing it for them. Just stop because it leaves them believing that the diagram is the work, and it's not. Making the diagram is the work. And if you do all the work for them and you show them the diagram, the diagram is easy. You just went to your cubicle and you drew some boxes and you put arrows between them. What's the big friggin' deal? They don't understand that, nor should they. They've never been asked to do it themselves. Stop doing it for them. Burn the straw dog. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think these guys have, I agree, and uh, the one piece that uh, resonates in me relative to this question is permission. Uh, the power of giving, uh, Mr. Werman told me a story about uh, when he was working for Liu Khan, he was already an information architect. And he was uh, worried that that would be a problem for this old man that he loved who was teaching him to be an architect. And uh, this was before he conceived it in terms of information architecture. But he was making uh, books and maps and diagrams and all sorts of things, in part because he was uh, uh, a junior and uh, had all this time to, to pursue his interest. And so at the office, he had a giant press sheet that he was looking at uh, for some project not related to the work of Lou Kahn's office. And, uh, and, and Lou Kahn, after uh, Mr. Worman had left the building, Lou put it up behind his own desk. And uh, that gave Mr. Worman permission. And then he also said, uh, you know, Ricky, even when I'm getting a haircut, I'm an architect. So uh, giving him permission to consider what he was doing in print as uh, as architecture, or at least as uh, you respect me and I'm giving you permission to do what you want, uh, not what I say to do. Last night. <laughs> Killer. <Thank you. laughs> so I, I come to this is my first time actually, um, but I come to a conference, <laughs> I come to a conference like this. It's so well done, um, and I get really fired up to go back home. Um, you know, I love my life here, but to <laughs> go back to my company to um, and sort of start using all the things I've learned and start having conversations with all the things I've learned. Um, but I know that I'm going to go back, um, you know, maybe on Tuesday now, <laughs> after this long weekend. Um, and I'm going to have 10 projects, and I'm the only UX person at my company. I'm, you know, we've got a marketing director who's got that skill set, um, a designer who's working towards that skill set, but you know, it's kind of me. Um, so how do, how do we get practical? Um, as UX teams of one, IE teams of one, um, being the only person appreciating this discipline in a company, how? What's the minimum viable engagement with projects, and how do we sort of figure that out in real life? <laughs> I think you need to share the work, uh, and maybe the politics of your organization make it so you can't tell them that you're making them do your work, 
But I think that that might be the way that UX teams of one or IAs that are operating solely, uh, solely in an organization need to, to kind of get through. Um, is by saying, hey, not instead of like, hey, I want you to do this information architecture task for me. It's like, hey, uh, do you think that you could like go and just collect all of the terms that mean this in the organization and just like email me a list, right? So you have to kind of like tactically break up the assignment into chunks that can be discreetly given to your partners so they can be a part of that that conversation. Um, going around and doing all of that mining yourself is going to be really tiring. Uh, so as many meetings as you can leave, having delegated as many things as you've accepted, I would say would put you in a really good position. Um, that said, do not frame this like, hey guys, so I'm too busy, so you're going to help me do my work. No, it's their job to work with you because you're the filter. They need to give you the content to go through. They need to help you to explore that territory. They shouldn't expect you to be putting on the headband and going down there by yourself. You don't, you don't need to do that all the time. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, so so it's it's uh it's not it's not a, it's not sort of a, a coincidence that, that we uh, call this the understanding B. Uh, understanding is at the center of the work that we do. We need to have the courage to dig into the complexity of our ecosystems, to drag people with us into the complexity of ecosystems, and to sort of come out on the other side with shared understanding. And it's interesting, this morning I was just looking at the etymology of the word understanding. Uh, it actually comes from a word understanden, where there's a, instead of a ding at the end, there's a dan. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so it's not standing under, it's standing together. That's really where the word comes from. And so I, I think that with the word understanding comes empathy, uh, comes kind of this notion of, of being together, of getting together, of coming together. Um, and hopefully that's sort of some of what we have done here uh, this morning. If you are jazzed up about information architecture, you're not yet a member of the Information Architecture Institute, uh, we have our annual meeting directly following this session. So get your box lunch and meet us in the garage room. Uh, and we will talk to you about what we're doing at the Institute, how we're tackling some of these things that we've talked about needing to tackle as a community, and we have a lot of opportunities for you to get involved, no matter what your level of experience is. And specifically, Tanya, hello, business analysis, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so see you guys in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> So as I said, uh, um, at Box Lunch today, uh, you can, it's, it's outside, you can go and grab, you can grab your lunch. We have a choice of uh, lunchtime entertainment for you. As, as I've said, the IAI meeting is going on in the garage. And right here